Welcome back everybody to our subject on jurisprudence. We're continuing looking at the development of natural law theories from these sort of ancient origins with Plato and Aristotle going through to the sort of medieval period where we talk about the impact and the influence of theological principles with that of St. Augustine and St. Aquinas. And then we're going to move on to the modern theories with Finnis and Fuller. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk specifically and keep our attention to that of the ancient theories of natural law. And we're going to focus on the idea of natural law developments through the Aristotelian age, through the age of Aristotle and his interpretations of natural law theory. So like I've just mentioned, we looked in the previous lesson at some of the fundamental ideas pertaining to specifically the origins of some of the principles of the natural law. We looked and took a lot of time with a detailed examination of the likes of Plato and the way in which Plato influenced theories of natural law and the importance of law and legal obedience. This lesson is going to move on from Plato and look at the works of Plato's students. Plato's student, of course, being that of Aristotle. Now, when we talk about natural law theories, for the most part, people tend to focus a lot of their time on Aristotle and then Aquinas. And what we seem to get the understanding of there is that Aristotle was the sort of founder and inventor of natural law theory. And then Aquinas takes up the Aristotelian principles and applies it with some sort of, uh, at, least for, uh, at least for Aquinas, the sort of modern um, theological approaches. But in reality, people tend to miss quite a lot of the work that was done and the foundations that were laid by people like Plato in the ancient period and then St. Augustine of Hippo in the theological early medieval period. And so we're going to make sure that we spend our time looking at Plato and Augustine as well as Aristotle and Aquinas. So as a brief recap to what we looked at in the previous lesson, we were looking, as you I mentioned, uh, Plato and Plato's theory of law. And what we did was we noted that Plato's theory of law actually played quite little into his broader understanding of the idea of the proper functioning of the city state. So in his one of his major works, the Republic or the Plato's Republic, we see a lot of dialogue going back and forth about the effective and proper role of the functioning of the Greek city state. Of course, this was written and was taking place during the life of Plato, where we have uh, a number of different things that take place within what is colloquially understood, at least within classics, is understood as uh, as classical Athens. So we have things like the Peloponnesian War, we have things like the life of Socrates, the life of Plato, and the life of Aristotle. And during this period of ancient Greek history, we see, of course, the formation of the city-states, the states such as um, that of Athens and that of Sparta, for example, the two most famous, at least. And so for the most part, when we look at the Republic, we're talking about the formation and the foundation of a proper functioning society and the way in which the city-state ought to operate. And Plato believed that the city-state ought to be organised on the basis of philosopher kings, the idea of there being sort of benevolent dictatorships, people who were trained from birth in the, in the ability to rule through statehood and instill values of virtue, ethics and wisdom. And with that in mind, we get this understanding that the law, the idea of positive law, um, is something that plays very little into the role of Plato's understanding of the proper functioning of the city-state, because for Plato, the, the most important thing was the philosopher kings, the, the ability to rule through this idea of a benevolent dictatorship. Now, Aristotle would take a different approach to his theory of law, and it's actually this Plato-Aristotle dichotomy that you can sort of see in the theological interpretations of natural law with the Augustine-Aquinas dichotomy that exists. Now, it's not necessarily Augustine's fault that he doesn't take on Aristotelian interpretations because Aristotle's works weren't rediscovered until after the death of Augustine, and really Aquinas manages to uh, instill a lot of of Aristotelian principles in his uh, a lot of his theories of theology not just natural law but what Aristotle does is take a completely different approach to his theory of law and actually look at his idea of human nature and what 
the most important thing that we should note is, is that the Aristotelian form of natural law theory in this sense is what we call teleological or teleological, depending on your pronunciation. Now, all this eff effectively means is referring to the importance of the end goal of a particular thing. Telos is the sort of Greek uh, translation of the word end. And so when we say that something is teleological, we're talking about it having some kind of the importance of it being reference to the end result of a particular thing. Now, if we were to apply teleological and teleology uh, language to that of, for example, normative ethics, we might say that consequentialist theories of ethics are teleological because they focused on the end goal. They focus on the consequences of an action and that therefore determines the morality of said action. And so as such, Aristotle understands law in this regard as being part of a broader conversation about the telos of human nature, about the end result, the, the, the purpose of human nature. And so with this in mind, Aristotle believed that not just humans had its own teleology, but actually all things in reality had their own teleology. So, for example, the telos, the teleology for a seed, is to grow into a plant or to grow into a tree, for example. The teleology for a baby animal is to grow and become an adult. And that this end result is very important in informing the ways in which we understand the, 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 uh, the initial state of that particular thing. So the way we understand the nature of seeds and baby animals animals is with reference to their teleology, with reference to the ability for them to become something else, to grow into a plant, to grow into an adult. And for humans, the human nature, and human nature specifically, the teleology here involves an understanding of reason. He believes that humans were specific and, and unique in their ability to reason. And in The Politics, a book that I'm looking at right now, which I have on the shelf um, from when I researched this lesson, uh, Aristotle argues that one of the teleologies for humans is the ability to develop into what he described as political creatures, animals which have social and political understandings, and that these social and political understandings were necessary, were important and required to fit into the broader political structure of what he described as the city-state, Athens, Sparta, etc., etc. He defined the city-state as the polis, the, or the polis, the political structure of the city-state. So, this is quite interesting for our understanding of law and our understanding of uh, human nature as well, in fact. So, uh, Aristotle understands human nature as being inherently tied to the teleology of developing into political creatures, having social and political understandings, and being able to fit into the broader city-state political structure and to become a, po a polis. Now, when we start to then instigate things relating to ethics and things relating to what makes something good and bad, teleology is important here as well, because the understanding of a thing's development into its telos, into its end result, is understood by Aristotle to be a good thing. Aristotle argues that not only um, is this a descriptive claim, is it a descriptive claim that a seed develops into a plan, but Aristotle also believed that it was normative in its framework. It should also be an ought statement. Not only is it the case that seeds develop into a plan, but that telos, that end goal, is something that should take place. It ought to be the case that seeds develop into plants. And then so applying this to more complicated structures like human nature, we can see that the telos for humans and for human nature and their ability to reason goes from being the descriptive in the sense that the actual telos itself, the teleology itself, is the development into political creatures. But it is also the fact that it is a good thing, that it ought to be the case that people, human nature, leads to a development into political creatures. And so the achievement of the telos is the achievement of a particular kind of good. And as a result, anything which contributes to the development of a thing's telos, of, a, of the teleology of a particular item, is also seen as good. So, for example, if we look at the teleology of seeds again, 
one of the things that can help with the development of a seed's um, ability to achieve its telos is to um, add water and sunlight. And so as a result of which, these sort of subsidiary ideas, these sort of um, the, the, these sort of attachment um, things that go along with the development of a seed into a plant are also good because they contribute to and further the development of a seed's telos into its end goal. And so a result of this, we can understand that things which develop a particular end goal, a particular teleology, um, it has its own teleology. And that own teleology is the promotion of the original teleology. You can almost understand this as a kind of sub-teleology. So the pouring of water onto a plant has its own end goal. It has its own teleology. And that end goal is to allow the plant to develop and grow, uh, the seed, sorry, to develop and grow into a plant. So the teleology, the telos of that particular action is informed by the telos of the item in question, the seed growing into the plant. So given all these influences, you might be wondering, well, what's the, what the hell has law got to do with any of these factors and any of these ideas? Well, if we then think about how law fits into things, we see that Aristotle believes that law fits into the contribution to the establishment of a human nature by looking to and contributing to the development of human nature's telos. So one of the things that um, Aristotle believed, therefore, was um, that when we look at what good law is and what a good law may be, we look at the contribution that that law has to mankind, the teleology towards mankind. And so what this does is it grounds the meaning of law and more importantly, and specifically, the meaning of what good law is and what law is fundamentally um, as having the ability to contribute to the development of a social structure. And for human beings and for human nature, as being political animals, being able to and be capable of living and thriving within the polis or the polis of a Greek city-state. So that's what Aristotle believed the, the, the teleology of law to be, to be one of these sort of sub-factors which contributes to the broader teleology of human nature. And unlike Plato... Um, Aristotle actually spends very little time exploring the nature of legal obligation, talking about this idea that there being a requirement that a one obeys the law. And to be fair, one of the reasons why Plato even talks about this idea of legal obligation is because of the impact of the trial and execution of his tutor, mentor, Socrates. And so ultimately, the reason why we see quite little time explaining the nature of legal obligation under the writings of Aristotle is because he was concerned more with the nature of what made law law, what made law good law, and the justification for the existence of law instead. And so when we then go from Aristotle to one of the most, influ uh, one of the most influential um, theorists uh, within human history, but also one of the theorists who is most heavily influenced himself by Aristotle himself, himself, um, this being St. Thomas Aquinas, we will start to see this Aristotelian influence start to um, become uh, very, very important. It's very clear to see just how much Aristotle influences St. Thomas Aquinas and how this develops into a more substantial theory of law, uh, a theory of natural law, which is then imbued with the doctrines of Catholic theology.